Coming up next on Art Rocks, a New Orleans artist who makes buildings dance to the beat of the city that surrounds them. I take my liberties um, in my expression of the, of the building. I'm looking to express not only a representation of the city, I'm really looking to represent the life here. A gallery that uses art to encourage play and vice versa. Through this very recognizable game, we find a meeting point where we are both equal. A photographer's timeless images. I'm inspired on a daily basis by what I see around me, by the, by the old buildings, by the, the, the beautiful farmland. And the painting that George Roderick believes cemented his reputation as an artist. That's all coming up on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine and thanks for joining us for Art Rocks. Many will recognize James Michalopoulos as Louisiana's premier painter when it comes to capturing the inimitable spirit of New Orleans, its buildings and its musicians. We visited James's studio to learn how this former street artist goes about committing the city's essential rhythm to canvas. I love to get started at five in the morning and work through till about midday, take a nice long break, um, maybe even up to three or four hours. I like to read after I eat and just uh, kind of wind my way back. But then I do like an afternoon session where I'm able to regard again critically what I've done in the morning and work on it and I like to finish in the early evening. It has a lot to do with the solitude. And uh, if in my studio there's a lot of activity, then I try to avoid it and start later in terms of my solitary uh, concerns. I take my liberties um, in my expression of the, of the building. I'm looking to express not only a representation of the city, I'm really looking to represent the life here. And so I like that the buildings have a sense of movement and musicality because I feel like I'm not really uh, portraying in a, a literal way the, the city's look. I'm more talking about our cultural life, trying to present something in a, a, a little more total sense. New Orleans has probably the most unique housing stock in the United States. It's an extraordinarily original environment. It's an environment that is social in a way that no other American city is social, in the sense that most of the city or much of the city was developed prior to a wide extensive use of the automobile. So there's a unique built quality to the social spaces in addition to a unique architectural style, our double shotgun, our single shotgun, and our more Victorian embellished buildings on the uptown side of the city. They're utterly uh, unusual and truly uh, inspiring. The ornamentation is truly special. The 20s and 30s saw a great deal of Victorian embellishment and it's a, it's a real pleasure to portray it. Really what I want to do is I want to go to the life, I want to go to the lifestyle and I want to be there. I want to live it and I hope the canvas represents that livingness. I use a lot of color because New Orleans is an extraordinarily colorful city. Color uh, for me is an embellishment uh, that is not unlike uh, a fanciful addition to a recipe or, an, or a flourish in a dance move. We're a culture that is extraordinarily lively, rich and out of control in a certain way. Music permeates, movement permeates, sensuality permeates. Paint is a way of expressing some of these more subtle qualities of our culture and uh, that the color certainly helps me get there. You learn a lot about a subject by not only looking at what's brightly lit but what is more subtly shaded 
And there's almost nothing more fascinating than our buildings in the sunlight. Uh, we enjoy a tremendous amount of sunlight. And there is a extraordinary beauty hidden in the, in the quietude of an afternoon shadow. I love portraits. There is a wonderful thing to portray a human being. I have been honored to paint the Jazz Fest six times. And uh, it is, uh, in a sense, uh, a, a responsibility to the city. Uh, it's a, an opportunity to present an aspect of our musical culture. And uh, yeah, it's a super challenge. I love taking it on. I love the, uh, the difficulty of it, uh, just working with a larger group and portraying intimately an artist's personality, getting in deeply into their music. I frequently alternate between the two tools, the knife and the brush. Uh, I find them both very useful for certain things. So typically I'll start a painting with a brush. I'll indicate the major proportions of the building and then I will, uh, I'll follow with a palette knife. And then it depends on the subject. I'll go back and forth. I don't have any rules or regulations. They're both great tools. I like to use them independently. The palette is, uh, is quite fresh. It's only about eight years old. And it probably has two inches of solid paint on it. Um, and I'm probably due for a trade out, but it's a fellow traveler for a long time and they're hard to get rid of. They're hard to change out, you know, I'm, I'm still in love with it. I did not start my artistic life as a child. Uh, it's something I came into kind of accidentally in adulthood. And uh, I didn't imagine that I would end up having more than a hobby with it, but I kind of fell in love with it and I've been deeply engaged for about 35 years now. In a sense, it becomes a spiritual practice or a psychological practice. So. The making of art is in part a, a study of transcendent life. So just like living in New Orleans is a study in transcendent life. It's like you go here because you get high on it. And it's a way to get to another place. It's a way to become larger. Over 30 some odd years, James definitely has become one of the most iconic painters in New Orleans. Uh, like a friend recently said, when you close your eyes and think about New Orleans, you see a James Michalopoulos painting. Michalopoulos says he rarely does commission work unless it's for a charitable cause, and he prefers painting what he's feeling at the time. His motto, always be painting for yourself. No matter where you live in Louisiana, opportunities to connect with the arts are everywhere. You just need to know where to look. So here are a few of the many festivals, exhibits and shows coming up around the state. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, visit the website at lpb.org slash artrocks. For more about these and other events, snag a copy of Country Roads magazine. There are racks all around town, and also the Art Rocks website has an archive of previous episodes. So to see any segment again, just log on to lpb.org. All around the world, there's a growing trend towards creating art using methods that invite viewers to become actively involved. In Denver, Colorado, Red Line Gallery embraced that idea with its playground exhibit. In doing so, the gallery challenged traditional ideas about how we interact with familiar spaces and objects. No, don't touch signs here. Let's take a look. Play. The seemingly simple act is something Courtney Lane Stell has thought about more seriously than most. 
Play is um, a very interesting concept for, for many reasons. It's a way to get children to engage with ideas of responsibility, caretaking, cooking, um, war. Play is also, conversely, a way to get away from a programmed um, understanding or way of looking at the world. And lastly, probably the one that excites me the most, is play is a way to think about the now. It's a way to engage in the current moment. As co-curator of the exhibit Playgrounds for Redline, a contemporary art center in Denver, she brought together national and international artists to mess around with the idea of play. So you see everything from found objects, sculptures, to artists who have engaged with hacking video games, to a couch fort, a pool table in the shape of Cuba, and even a hopscotch that's thousands and thousands of numbers long that goes throughout the city. Through this very recognizable game, we find a meeting point where we are both equal. Argentinian artist Augustina Woodgate said she hopes that common ground will inspire conversation. No one knows their neighbor anymore. No one uses the sidewalk anymore. No, one's, no one plays outside anymore. Woodgate has installed her hopscotch boards several locations throughout the world, including her native Buenos Aires and, most recently, Denver, Colorado. Her work, connected through the city's storm drains, is meant to be temporary. The type of paint that I'm using eventually, eventually will run away, it will, it will wash off uh, with, the, with the food traffic as well as with the weather, if it rains a lot. Or, so I, it's important for me also to maintain that level of ephemer, ephemeral aspect of, of a hopscotch. Woodgate works with communities to identify places they believe hopscotch could get people talking. It's interesting in different, different neighborhoods, as well as in different cities and in different countries, the conversation changes. Right? The hopscotch is like a starting point for them to discuss all these other topics between them, really. My purpose with this work is just like pay attention to, it's like bring attention to, to sidewalks, to, to that public space that has been throughout history, a very important political space. A sense of place was also important to artist Connor McGarrigal's work. You can see this long line that is a map. It's a satellite image of the length of Colfax. And Connor, who's an Irish artist, found out that Colfax is the longest avenue um, in the nation. So we walked from the east end of Colfax all the way to the other end west. Um, and hired a satellite to take a picture of him throughout that entire walk. So it was a sort of straight line wandering, so to say, uh, and a way to explore the city and, and to see um, what it's really like from ground level. Well, the reason why I love art is because art is communication for me, and it's very base level. Um, we are all individuals and we're all part of larger society and artists um, act as mirrors, artists push against, artists connect us. And in this instance, encourage each of us to play. Herman, Missouri photographer William Fields finds his inspiration in the rolling landscapes of Missouri River Country. His photographic techniques lend a mystery and a sense of timelessness to his images. Look closer. Through his photography, William Fields explores his fascination with a landscape shaped by rivers. The natural geometry of the land. The infinite variety of shapes and colors and the passing generations of people working that land. I constantly am 
overwhelmed and knocked to my knees by the beauty that I see all around me. I came here 21 years ago and I didn't know how long I would stay, but I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else in my life because of the fact that I'm inspired on a daily basis by what I see around me, by the, by the old buildings, by the, the, the beautiful farmland, and by the, just the, the amazing Missouri River um, and, and everything it has to offer. The, the open spaces and it's the, uh, the quality of light and it's the, uh, the way uh, the distant hills can become like a watercolor where there's, there's layers of values fr from one row of trees to the next, to the next, to the next hill, to the next farm. Of course, the sky. The sky is always a huge part of when I make a picture. I, I look for uh, active skies, uh, you know, big, strong clouds, and, and you know, towering stuff in the, in the atmosphere. That's that's what excites me. It's just a, a constant visual delight to me. One of the great things that I find so unique about this area is uh, the river bottoms. All of this land that we see out here, these cornfields and, and these farms, um, were once part of the river itself. The, the river came right here to this building. This was, this was a port where they shipped stuff. So all that land out there it is now part of the landscape. And it was when Lewis and Clark came up the river, it was the river. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the the physical decay, the, the machine that's rusting on the side of the trail or the, the barn that's falling down with one door hanging off the hinges and, you know, all of those things are, are just a visual treat. You know, it's great stuff. It's just a, a, a big concept that's hard to get my arms around in words sometimes. If I could articulate it, I wouldn't have to make pictures of it. When most of us think of legendary Louisiana painter George Rodrigue, it's his blue dogs that leap to mind. But Rodrigue had a special place in his heart for another painting, the Aioli Dinner. Ogden Museum curator Bradley Sumrall explains the significance behind this painting for Rodrigue and the culture that raised him. This is George Rodrigue's Aioli Dinner from 1971. This was the first major painting where Rodrigue used the human figure in the landscape. It's really considered his masterpiece by the family and by uh, scholars, and we're really, really proud to have it here at the Ogden. Uh, so this depicts the Darby House outside of New Iberia and a traditional dinner that was held within the French Creole families there. Uh, the men would come with their own bottle of wine and sit around the table. These dinners would last for like six hours. One of the elders would make the aioli, which is a mayonnaise, uh, and then the boys would serve the table and the women did all of the cooking. And they were um, uh, these gourmet societies, uh, these little groups of, of uh, gour gourmands within the uh, uh, French Creole culture. Uh, but what you see in this composition is how he pushed all of the action up into the upper section of the painting and then you have this beautiful foreground uh, that almost becomes like an abstraction of the greens and the browns and the blacks here. And it's truly masterful and shows the trajectory of his career. So Rodrigue was painting what he knew. And uh, I saw an interview with him recently where he said, don't let anybody tell you what to paint. Paint what you know. And this is what he knew. This is the culture that he knew. And as a matter of fact, I believe that this is his grandfather uh, there. One of George Rodrigue's daughter-in-law's uh, relatives is in the painting too. These were the people of his area. This is a painting that's deeply tied to the culture and the traditions of a particular place. Uh, as we like to say at the Ogden, it has a really strong sense of place. And I think that's what sets it apart from many paintings of this period. Few of us ever forget the first horror stories we heard. Those first frights stay with us and maybe even made us believe in magic for a little while. Now, one Orlando, Florida-based theatre troupe is bringing that delicious sense of dread to the stage. Here's a look behind the scenes of Phantasmagoria. Hey, 
About six years ago, I said, I need to get out of my own box and redefine what a horror circus means to me. Within two months, we had a show called Phantasmagoria, replete with the puppets and the costuming and the projections and everything we were doing. I think what really sets it apart from other theater I've been to is that it's really kind of a multi-sensory experience. It's not strictly theater. I've been in trance since day one. Automatically, I was drawn in to their performance. After that first line, your hook, it's hard to stop watching, take your eyes off of something, because they always have their characters doing something. Lots of people who come aboard, they enjoy the show, they get pulled into the world of the show, and they have great talents that we can use, whether they're great dancers or, or great stage combat people or great circus artists. I was initially just an audience member. There's just something about the, like the weird Victorian storytelling world, the little sandbox that we get to play in, that I, I can't stop. The fastening is removed, and one half of the window is so far upon us again. Victoria, darling. It's just simply divine and to have this gothic darkness to it, even better. When we first designed these costumes, we had never even heard the word steampunk. We were designing Victorian costumes with a twist. And then everybody started saying to us, oh, you're steampunk. And we went, yes, we are. It's kind of fun to see little steampunk family that we kind of have. Their costumes are sometimes even nicer than ours, so. <laughs> very eccentric individuals. I happen to be an eccentric individual myself, so we seem to mesh pretty well. I saw their performance at Gods and Monsters, the comic book shop. I think all the cosplayers there initially thought, who are these people? Because they don't know the characters that they play in this show. So they were a little skeptical, but once they saw that performance, I think they had them hooked. If you look at what Phantasmagoria features, it's folklore and it's literature of fantasy and horror, and we're just kind of a continuation of that tradition of, of dreamers, I think. We've got so many different layers and so many different parts and pieces that create us as a whole. I really think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that we can't relate to, and that's what we strive for. These are people who are really special to us, and they treat us wonderfully and support us. Let's do the same with them. And that's what I think a lot of people can learn about quote-unquote fandom, or the people that follow you, is they have a stake in this too. We're trying to barbecue the audience. <laughs> people started saying to us, you know, you guys are like a graphic novel come to life. You're like a, a living comic book. And we started going, okay, let's use that. Within the world of the comic book story, we can take a pause from it being a theatrical presentation of a literary work, and we can really take the time to dive into the relationships between these characters. We're in the midst of pre-production on the very first issue, which we call Issue Zero, and it's kind of an introduction to the troupe. At this point, it's really wonderful to watch how the storyboards have built off of the story and then we've gone into the studio and built visual storyboards with photography. What other sorts of shenanigans and adventures have they been getting into when they're not presenting a show for an audience? What goes on between the shows? Barry Kirsch, who is our photographer, who walked in the door one day and just said, I really like what you guys want to do, and what I like about it is the way you've built a family, and you're living that family. It truly has done that weird artistic switch where the actors playing the troupe have become the troupe. We are Phantasmagoria, and that's kind of beautiful. We love it. And that's going to do it for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash Art Rocks. And if you want more, Country Roads Magazine is a great resource for learning all about what's going on in the state's vibrant arts and culture, close to home and all around Louisiana. Until next week, I've been James Fox Smith, and thanks for watching.